page 133 in the red book. Page Morning, good to see everybody again. Do appreciate everybody being here. Do pray for uh, everybody that's not here. We got several that's uh, vacating, several got other things going on. So uh, do pray for them. Pray, Lord, this bless this morning. Let's have church this morning. Let's, uh, just let the Lord have His way. Uh, we we'll get into the bulletin here this morning. Brother Ray's here to preach. Uh, do pray for him uh, tonight. Service. Uh, Mac Arnold will be here to preach. Do pray for him tonight as he comes. Uh, uh, September 11th, special on for the youth group. Also, September 11th, business meeting. September 17th and 18th, we'll be having a, a weekend Bible camp down at Ebenezer Christian Home. Uh, 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 so do pray about that. Pray the Lord just have his way in it. Uh, do, uh, if, you, if anybody wants to help, you'll be more than welcome. We'll, uh, we'll figure all that out. Just let me know if you do, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll figure that out. But uh, September 18th, uh, we'll be doing... Uh, also, at, at that evening, will be recovering soldier ministry, Sunday night service, cookout at the pavilion for the recovery soldiers uh, at 5.30. So, uh, September 25th, special album for the building fund. Also, September 25th, we'll be having a baptism down at the creek, at Roan Creek, so do pray about that. Uh, October 9th, we'll be having a special offer for the youth group. Also, October 9th, business meeting. And October 9th through the 14th, we'll be having a revival here. Uh, the preachers, Derek Wilson, will be here the 9th and the 10th. Chuck Moorefield, the 11th and 12th. Billy Moorefield will be the 13th and 14th. And we'll be having singers, Timber Ridge, Josh Jones family, and the Corinth Choir. And I think they got some others already. So uh, do pray for this uh, uh, too. So pray for our revival. Pray the Lord this touch here in the, the revival. October 16th, uh, Steve Duggar will be here to preach the night service. And October 15th, uh, we're going to try to... Uh, do uh, youth uh, take the youth uh, to Gentry Falls? So we'll probably uh, do that. Uh, the, I don't know what time we'll meet yet. We'll figure that out. But we'll probably just take a hike up to Gentry Falls on that Saturday. So and then our class will go do our thing Saturday evening. So but do uh, do uh, do pray for that. Pray uh, for all these services. And October 30th, you Sunday. Also special on for building. For the building fund, then October 30th, trunk or treat and the chili cook off at 6 p.m. So uh, everybody do remember this, and uh, uh, 
in this chili cook-off, it's fixed. Dennis wins every year, so it's fixed. I don't know it's fixed, but we'll, uh, I guess we'll do it anyway. <laughs> but uh, do pray for these services. Pray for our church. Pray the Lord this touch here and uh, uh, he just have his way here. So anything else I'm forgetting? Nothing? All right. We'll get into the prayer requests. Uh, Ralph Mink, Diane Eisenhower, Riley Allen, Brooke Hutchinson, Clifton and Adam, Kathy Woodard, Louise Markham, Jerry Murray, Joel Murray Bishop, Kim Bernard, the Reason family, Keith Harry, Chris Pleasant, David Wilson, Carter Harris, Kennedy Greer, Ashley White, Brenda Norris, Jalen Sutherland, Daniel Furches, Danny McAlay, Mildred Pace, Jerry Duggar, Joanne Pope, Bay Church, Mary Bailey, Pierstown, Bab or Pierstown Church, uh, Clara Hurd, Lynn Cortner, Sue Potter, Brittany and Baby, Lester Dunn, Elbert and Wanda Sward, Harold and Shirley Rice, Sanford and Humphrey and Wife, Bob Hick, Andy Lowe, David Burnett, Ryan, Mike Reynolds, Holly McFadden, Eddie's family, Ebenezer Christian Home, Ross Stow, Luella Dunn, Dennis and Hazel, Dorothy Keller, Dana Buchanan, Cindy White, Lucas Perdue, Laura Tressler, Bud Crosswhite, Harley Rankin, Ben Bowers, Kenny and Jane Head, Ed Ham, Sandra Moorfield, Lane Miller, Francis Brooks, John Amy and the Boys, the Nursing Home, John Roberts, family, Brenda Lunsford, Tracy Portner, William Williams, Katie Lunsford, Dolores Anderson, Eden Eisenhower and his baby, Chuck Moorfield and family, and Ryan Morley, Michelle Worley, David Ward, Terry Melissa, Benji Watson, Tommy Jack Shown, Joe Doltz, Mindy Moorfield, Avery Key, Elaine Kirby, Aaron Steele, Randy Lewis, Emily Church, Steve Kress, Buffy Kernett, Delmer, Wendell Carraway, Marina Jennings, Rick Stout, June Brady, Donna Kim Garrett, David Holloway, Teresa McAuley, Margaret Eisenhower, Bob Miller, our church, John Yates, Joseph Rourke, Kathy McFadden, Wanda Tim, Roby Philippi, Unspoken, Emily and Archie, uh, Ruby Payne, Justin Miranda, and the kids. Anybody else? Is that it? I think that's it. Uh, Who's that? Thursday, you said? Let me pray for him. Just pray for him. Anybody else? Is that it? Any birthdays coming up this week? Any anniversaries? Is that it? Well, if that's it, we'll step out now and have our morning fellowship. I ain't forgetting nothing else, am I? We have our, step out now and have our morning fellowship. Shake everybody's hand, tell them you're glad to see them, whether you mean it or not.
just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. <laughs> I was just kidding. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> do pray, shake Brother Ray for being with us this morning. I do pray for Terry and Emma's are uh, traveling and uh, vacating. And everybody else, you know, Eddie and them, they got their yearly thing. It's going to youth. Okay. Go ahead and do it. Anybody else got a word or a song before we turn it over to Brother Ray? Anybody? Hmm? Hey. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think that would probably be the... And I don't even know if I can make a joyful noise, right? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, but nobody got a word, right? Ray's going to sing for us, I think. <laughs> No, we do appreciate him being here. Uh, Ray, you come on, do what the Lord have you to do. All right, well, it's a privilege to be here in God's house and uh, nice. I, I tell you, this is the first time, of course, I've been here, and you've only been having services in here, I think, since what's August 14th, something like that. But beautiful beautiful sanctuary, beautiful church, and I uh, just thank the Lord for him blessing you the way that he has, and uh, of course, Brother Terry's away getting some, I'm sure, well-needed rest from uh, all that he's been doing, helping out with the church here, so we pray for him and Miss Melissa, and pray that God give them a good restful week. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter number 7 this morning, John chapter number 7, verse number 45. That's what we're going to read, going to read verses 45 down to verse number 53. Just hope to be a blessing to you today. And uh, you just pray for us. We're always standing in need of your prayers. And just pray God to bless us. Let's stand on our feet and reverence God's word this morning. John chapter number 7, verse number 45 is where we're going to begin reading. Now Jesus has just got done uh, teaching and the, they're all marveling at Jesus and his authority and his teachings and there's kind of a division among the people. Of course, they love Jesus. Many of them love Jesus. And half of them wanted to crown him, make him king right there. And of course, 
Others was wanting to kill him, especially the Pharisees, Sadducees. They just could not figure out how to get rid of Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's like one was waiting on the other to take care of him. And that's kind of the setting for what we're getting ready to read in verse number 45. Notice what the Word of God says. John 7, verse number 45. The Bible says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also a gal of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into his own house. Father, we thank you and we praise you today for the privilege and the opportunity just to stand once again behind the sacred desk. God, we ask you, Lord, that you would just bless not only the reading of your word, but God, help us this morning, open our mouths, loosen our lips, Father, that we'd preach that which you would have for these today. And God, I pray that you'd open the hearts and the minds of those that are here, God, that they would take and receive the word of God. May the Holy Spirit of God do a work today in those that are here. Father, I pray that your will be accomplished in this service. If they be one among us today that's lost and undone without you, God, may this be the day, may this be the hour of salvation. And God, just have your will now and have your way in all things. And Father, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for all that's done. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to look at one particular verse this morning, and that's verse number 46. And as they're arguing over Jesus and, you know, one's, uh, Pharisees are pointing at the Sadducees and the Pharisees are pointing at the Pharisees and they're saying, why don't you take care of this man? And they're really they were afraid of the people because Jesus had such a strong effect before the people. And that's what they said in verse number 46. The Bible says the answer, the officers answered, never man spake like this man. They said, listen, this guy, no one's ever spoke like him. No one, the Bible says in other places that uh, he spoke with authority and he spoke with power. And, you know, Jesus didn't have to say, get up and, uh, if you want to call it preaching or teaching, he didn't have to do it for long periods of time like we see today. Hey, a lot of times he was very short and sweet and very to the point of what needed to be said. And there is a saying uh, that little is much when God is in it. You've probably heard that saying. As a matter of fact, we used to sing a song uh, at the church, and that's what it was called, was little as much when God is in it. And uh, I found out that through the years that God will get in it if you'll just give it to him. And little is much, though, when God is in it. And I got to thinking about those words, never man spake like this man. And I got to thinking about the fact that Jesus, uh, how that it didn't take a whole lot, you know, he proved that little is much when uh, that little boy brought of his uh, meal that day, and those five loaves and those fish, and the Bible says that he took those and he break them and he began to pass them out among the 5,000, and really probably about 15,000 people, because the Bible said 5,000 men. So you count women and children, there's probably around 15,000 people. And with those five small loaves and those fish, the Bible says that they, that they fed all those people. The Bible says that they were full, and then they took up 12 baskets of extra. God proved that day, and Jesus proved that day, that little is much when God is in it. Not only that, the Bible says that he took 12 ordinary men, his 12 disciples, and with those 12 men, the Bible says in the book of Acts that he turned the world upside down. With 12 ordinary men, I'm not talking about educated men, I'm talking about fishermen, I'm talking about tax collectors, I'm talking about those that weren't high in society, weren't very educated men, but they took notice they had been with Jesus. And with those 12 ordinary men that Jesus called, turned the whole world upside down. Little is much when God is in it. You know, we get to looking, and you see this morning, you may say, well, there's not a whole lot of people here, and there's a lot of churches. Me and uh, my wife was talking this morning on the way to church, and she said, boy, when you get to thinking about it, there's a lot of churches in this county, a lot of churches up in these mountains, and you might look at a lot of them, and you say, you know what, they're not big churches, and uh, you know, they're not what we call powerful churches or mega churches, but I got news for you today, little as much 
when God is in it. It don't take a big number. It don't take a big fancy church. It don't take all that. If you'll just give it over to God, God will use what you have because little is much when God is in it. You know, as, as powerful as Jesus' actions were, and everything Jesus done was powerful, his actions were powerful, but you know that his words were just as powerful as well. He didn't have to say a whole lot. As a matter of fact, as the message is going to prove out this morning, many times Jesus just spoke the very few words, but the power that are in those words, the power that was in those words, it's absolutely unbelievable what Jesus was able to accomplish which is a few words because little is much in his actions, little is much in his words. And that's what I want to think on this morning, the fact that it's short and it's sweet. Matter of fact, the words of Jesus, the words of God are sweet. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. His words have a short uh, have a certain power, and that's what I want to preach on this morning is short and sweet. And you're probably glad to hear that a preacher say, I'm going to preach short and sweet this morning. And uh, we'll do our best, but I'm not talking mainly about me, I'm talking more about the words of Jesus Christ being short and sweet. And you think about this. Many times we as, I, I thought about this as preachers, you know a lot of preachers, they think the longer they preach, the better that it is. I found out that, hey, when I've been on your end, sitting there in the pew, some of the best preaching I've ever heard is just they just got up, they preach what God gave them, and they sit down. They didn't stand up, and they didn't keep trying to go, and keep trying to go, and keep trying to go. About that way in praying. You know, some people think you get up, and the longer you pray, and the more fancy that you pray, they expect maybe more is going to happen from heaven. I think about Elijah got up, and he prayed 63 words, and the fire fell from heaven. You don't have to get up and go on and on and on and on for God to do something. Little is much when God is in it. Sometimes it just needs to be short and sweet. I want you to think about it this morning. Give you five quick things about Jesus Christ that were short and sweet, but think about the power that are in these things. First of all, there's a calling power. Jesus had a calling power, and it was short and sweet. The Bible said in John 11, verses 43 and 44, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Here Lazarus was. Bible said they sent word to Jesus. They said, Thou friend that thou lovest is, dead, is, is sick. And they called for Jesus to come. The Bible says he tarried. He didn't come right away. And when he did get there, they said, Listen, he's been dead. He's been dead four days by now. He stinketh. And the Bible says, you remember it said Jesus swept him. And the Bible said, Oh, how he loved Lazarus. He said, I want you to roll away the stone. They rolled that stone away. He didn't get up and, and give some big elaborate speech. He didn't get up and explain what was about to happen. He didn't use science to try to say, well, now this is what's going to take place. Bible said, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Three words is all it took. And a dead man received life and come hopping out of that tomb. Now, he has a calling power. There's a certain calling power about the voice and the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior today. I get to thinking about he called for Lazarus. Lazarus, come forward. I get to thinking about the fact that he has a calling power. And if you know what I'm talking about, there was a night in my life when there was a calling power that come to me and it brought this dead man to life once again. If you're saved this morning... If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you remember when Jesus Christ was calling you, when he was knocking on your heart's door? The Bible says in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand and I knock, and if you, any man open up unto me, I will come in and sup with him. And that's the way that it was. He was actually calling me on a Sunday morning, and I didn't give my heart over to him then, but thank the good Lord for his patience. He come again that Sunday night, and he knocked on my heart's door, and he called me and he bade me and I stepped out and come forward and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. The Holy Spirit of God was calling me and it wasn't something fancy. It was just that conviction, that Holy Ghost conviction that God sets upon your soul when you get saved and he has a calling power. You think about it. It's not something big and fancy. As a matter of fact, 
What did Jesus, when he called most all of his disciples, when the Bible says he called James and called John, when the Bible says that he called Peter and he called Andrew, the Bible says when he called most of his disciples, what did he, did he have to give them some kind of brochure? Did he have to go and convince them to follow him? Did he have to go and beg them to follow him? As a matter of fact, what did he say on most occasions? Two words, follow me. It's short. It's sweet, but all oh, the power of Jesus Christ, he has a calling power, and I'm glad that he still calls today. He's still calling today. He's still knocking on heart's doors. He's still uh, saying, follow me. He's still saying, come forth. And the Bible says that we which were once dead have been quickened. That means to be brought to life. And he has a calling power today. He's still saving souls today. That's why you and I need to pray today. Pray for lost people. Pray that they'd see their need. And just pray that God would continue to call and call them into the family of God. Listen, he's still calling today. He's still placing us in the church. And I'm not talking about the church as a physical building. I'm talking about the church like the Bible says, that called out assembly, called out of the world, called out from death, called out from the grave, quickened, bringing life to us spiritually and placing us in the family of God. He's still calling those today. And I'm glad to say praise his holy name. He still's not done calling us. Matter of fact, there's still one call left to come. There's still one call left to come. And we should be listening for that call. The Bible says in Revelation 4, 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things that must be hereafter the calling power of Jesus there's still a day coming there's still the ultimate calling left when they're when the, uh, he's going to split those eastern skies and he's going to say come up hither and those of us that's been held down all these years with this gravitational pull we're going to lose that gravitational pull and we're going to go up and be with him forever the Bible says thank God for the calling power of Jesus Christ and one day we're going to be called up to be with him forever we're going to leave all this sickness we're going to leave all this sorrow there's not going to be any hospitals there's not going to be any nursing homes there's not going to be any of that no more cancer, no more COVID, no more nothing. We're going to be with him forever in a place that's going to be perfect. That's the calling power of Jesus Christ. Nothing big, nothing elaborate. Just as he said, Lazarus, come forth. Just as he said, uh, follow me. Just as he says, come up hither. Just short and sweet. And I don't know about you, but that's sweet to me, the calling power of Jesus Christ. But not only does he have a calling power, he has a calming power. He has a calming power. The Bible says in Mark 4, verse number 39, and he arose. If you remember, here he was. He had just performed the miracles. No doubt he was tired. Uh, yes, I know he was God in the flesh, but he was also 100% man. He got hungry. He got thirsty just like we do, and he got tired just like we do. He needed to pray like you and I do. The Bible says on other occasions that he'd go off alone and pray uh, to God the Father. But on this instance, here he was, and the Bible says that he was in the boat, and he was asleep, he was resting, and the, the ship enters into a storm, the disciples enter into a storm, and of course they get scared, they get afraid, and they go, and they wake Jesus up, and they say, carest thou not that we perish? That has to be one of the most foolish questions in all the Bible. Carest thou not that we perish? Well, of course he cared for them. He loved them. And the Bible says he got up, and the Bible says in Mark 4, 39, and he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, was it some big long speech? No, he said, peace, be still. Three simple words, peace, be still. And the Bible said, and the wind ceased, and there was a great, Three words is all it took for Jesus, the very Son of God, to calm nature. Well, you think about that. Nature obeys the Creator. 
and the sea obeyed the Creator, and the winds obeyed the Creator, and the rain obeyed the Creator, and what was a tumultuous situation, and the Bible says it was tumultuous, and the sea was tumultuous, and they was being tossed to and fro, and the water was lapping over into the boat, and it was a scary situation, and oh Jesus, I mean he had been asleep. Can you imagine Jesus? He walks over to the edge of the ship and he probably is rubbing his eyes. He's getting the sleep out of his eyes. He just woke him up and he looks and he probably yawns a little bit and he says, peace, be still. And everything just immediately calms down. There is a calming power, not just a calling power, but a calming power to Jesus Christ. I think about that voice if you can calm the wind and you can calm the sea, and that's certainly what he did. If he can calm the wind and he can calm the sea, don't you think that when you're having trials in your life, don't you think that when there's storms in your life, that he can calm them as well? Sometimes we have things come our way, circumstances, situations. You know what I'm talking about. Hey, very seldom is it smooth sailing in this Christian life. The Bible talks about, and we oftentimes sing the old ship of Zion. Well, I tell you what, the old ship of Zion, sometimes it gets pretty tumultuous itself. And sometimes our lives, they say, they say, and I've heard preachers say, that you're either one of three things. You're either headed into a storm, you're in the midst of a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. Very seldom is life peaceful. You say, well, why is that, preacher? We're Christians. We're living for God. Shouldn't things be easy for us? Absolutely not. Listen, God don't owe us anything. He saved our soul. I think about C.T. Townsend. He sings a song, and that's what it's called, is You Don't Owe Me a Thing. And, he, and it starts off, and it says, at the very beginning of the song, he said, I've been thinking, Lord, I'm one of your children. Shouldn't things be better for me? He said, but then I'm reminded, you don't owe me a thing. You don't owe me not one single thing, Lord. You saved my soul. You saved me forever. You don't owe me anything in this life. But the fact of the matter is, we're living in a broken world. That's, this is not the way it's supposed to be. There's not supposed to be death. There's not supposed to be suffering. That's not what God intended. You say, well, what, God did, what did God intend? Go back to Genesis, chapter number 1. The Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. Matter of fact, the Bible says it was very good. There was no death. There was no separation. There were no thorns. There were, I mean, there was none of that. The Bible said everything was perfect. We're the ones that messed it up. Adam brought sin into the world when he disobeyed God. Now we're living in a broken world. The Bible says that even the earth groaneth and it travaileth a day. And all we're waiting for is the day that everything's going to go back to the way it's supposed to be. And there will be that day. God is going to set everything straight. But until that time, we're living in a broken world. We're living in a world that's not the way that it should be. And we're going to suffer persecution. The Bible says, all that live righteously shall suffer persecution. Jesus warned us of this. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Hey, it shouldn't surprise us that we're having a difficult time. But when we have difficult times, when the storms of life are about to capsize your ship, when the storms of life are about to capsize your life, uh, your life, aren't you glad that there's a calming power in the voice of Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but there's times in my life when things have been topsy-turvy, upside down, and we get to looking and they're calling evil good and good evil, and things are just absolutely uh, turned upside down, and we're in the middle of a storm. But then I think about the fact that the voice of Jesus can speak to my heart and it can calm me down. Some of the best things that you can ever do, you say, what should I do when I'm having a difficult time? What should I do when, when things are not going right in my life? Hey, I found that the best cure for that, and I know it's kind of cliche, is get into the Word of God. I got an app on my phone, and it's called uh, Bible.is, and all it is is it just reads the Scripture, and it's being read to you. Some of the mornings when I go on my morning runs, or sometimes when I'm working outside, or I'm mowing the yard, or I'm weed eating, I put my earbuds in, and uh, sometimes I just, I just put it on that Bible and it just reads to me. And I tell you what, there is a calming power to just listening to the Word of God. I don't know, we, we take it for granted that we got this Bible and we say, well, yeah, it's a Bible and, and we call it the Word of God. But do you actually believe that this is the Word of God? 
Do you actually believe that this was inspired? Do you actually believe that it's in, that word inspired means to be God breathed? That means I believe from, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation that these are the very words of God. And I know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you got the red letter edition, and that's the words of Jesus. But I got news for you. Every bit of this is the word of God. And I know it's been pinned down by men of old as the Holy Spirit of God moved upon their hearts, but there's a calmness to reading the Word of God. You can be having a bad day, and if you don't believe me, try it out. You can be having a rough day, a bad day, and just either read the Word of God or listen to the Word of God, and you'll find that things begin to calm down. That doesn't mean that your problems are going away. That doesn't mean that the situation is automatically going to get better, but I will tell you this, everything will start to calm down a little bit, and you can feel the calmness, and as Jesus speaks to your heart, and I forgot the mic's up there, and Jesus speaks to your heart, things begin to calm down. I tell you, there's a common power to the voice of Jesus. He said, peace be still, but I thank God that there's times in my life that he can say, peace be still, and the storms of my life begin to calm down also. And if, you're, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. There's a calling power that's short and sweet when it comes to Jesus. There's a calming power that's short and sweet when it comes to Jesus. Number three, there is a correcting power. There is a correcting power. Luke 12, 28, the Bible says, If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? And he said, O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. Five simple words. On this particular day, uh, they were out there, and he's teaching them a lesson. He said, I want you to look at the sparrows. I want you to look at the birds that are flying. I want you to look at the grass in the field. He says, you're so worried about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to put on. He said, I want you to look at these birds. He said, they don't, gather bar they don't gather in the barn. They don't sow. They don't reap. But yet, your father in heaven, he makes sure they have enough to eat. And he said, if he'll take care of those birds, how much more do you mean to them than these birds? He said, I want you to look at the flowers and the grass here on the ground. He said, how beautiful they are. And he said, yet Solomon, who was the richest man on the face of the earth, and, and also the wisest man on the face of the earth, he said, even Solomon in all his splendor cannot match the beauty of these flowers. He said, and they're here today, and then they're thrown into the oven. Don't you think that if God will clothe them in this splendor, in this beauty, don't you think he'll take care of you? And he looked at those disciples, and he said, Oh, ye of little faith. He didn't browbeat them. He didn't beat them over the head. But in love, he was correcting them. He let them know, listen, I need to correct you on some things. You're so worried. And he said, but listen, he said, there's no reason for you to worry. He said, is worry going to change? And, and some of us, some of us are worriers, aren't we? Now, I'm not much of a worrier. You can ask my wife, and sometimes that comes off like you don't care. But I, listen, it's not that I don't care. I just don't worry a whole lot. I, you know, and that's what Jesus said. He said, listen, how many of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? In other words, he said, if you're, if you're, uh, it's like if you're short, it don't matter how much you worry about it, it's not going to make you any taller. It'd be like me saying, sitting around worrying about not having a whole lot of hair. I can worry all I want. It ain't going to make me grow. It ain't going to make my hair grow. I'm not going to look like Fabio just because I'm worried about it, so there ain't no use worrying about it. He said, listen, and that's the way it is. He said, he, you worry, and as a matter of fact, the more you worry, it's bad for your health. It's bad for your health. He said, listen, you can't change not one simple thing about worrying. And he wasn't trying to be harsh with them. He wasn't trying to be mean. But there's a correcting power when it comes to the Word of God. This Bible will keep us straight. It corrects us. It tells us where we're going wrong. And if, as a matter of fact, we'd be a lot better off if we'd just simply read it, believe it, do what it said, and let it correct us. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He doesn't try to correct us because he's mean to us. He tries to correct us because he loves us. Did you know that those words, O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, ye of little faith, I preach a message on that very thought, O oh, ye of little faith, no less than five times. Does Jesus say that to his disciples? O ye of little faith. 
I mean, these are men that walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus. These are men that seen him perform all these miracles, and yet five times he had to look at these disciples and said, O ye of little faith. Now what's that say about us? What's that say about us? There's a correcting power in the voice of Jesus. You know what? If there is one thing that we need, that's correcting. And that's what we're lacking in. He, uh, he is there to correct us when we're wrong. Boy, I'm glad for that. I'm glad that I, I can't get away. I don't know about you, but I can't get away with anything. If I say the wrong thing, son, right there, Jesus is there and he's correcting me. If I, if I go to the wrong place, Jesus is right there correcting me. If I think the wrong thing, Jesus is right there correcting me. That's called chastisement. That's when, that's when Jesus is correcting. That's that still, small voice. That's Jesus who lives on the inside. That's what the Bible teaches when he saves your soul. That's why he says when he knocks on your door, he's knocking on the door of your heart, and you open up and you let him in, and you say, well, that, 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 that's when he saved your soul. Well, did you ever think about that? He knocks on your heart's door, you open up, you let him in. The Bible doesn't never say anything about him leaving. Matter of fact, the Bible said, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you open that door and let him in, he comes in, it's a permanent. He's not going anywhere. He not, he's not leaving. He's right there with you, and the Holy Spirit of God moves in, and that's why if you're a child of God, if you're a child of God, you can't get away with anything. Like I said, you say the wrong thing, he's correcting you. You go the wrong place, he's correcting you. You do the wrong thing, he's correcting you. And I thank God for that. The Bible said that where there's no chastisement, your bastards are not sons. That means if you can do what you want to do and you can say what you want to say and go to where you want to go and do all the wrong things and you never feel bad about it, you're not one of his. I'm glad for chastisement. Listen, that's how I know that I'm my mother's child because she beat the devil out of me when I was young. And she could do that because she was my mother. I was her child. Most people don't whip other people's children. They whip their own children. And that's why Jesus will chastise us because we're his children. That, that's evidence that you're a child of God. And there's a correcting power. And I thank God for that. The correcting power of Jesus, it may be short, but I'm thankful for it. It's so sweet because it's out of love. And that's the way we ought to correct others. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 14, and 15 that we henceforth be no more, uh, no more children tossed to and fro or carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But listen to this. But speaking the truth in love. That's how you correct people. You speak the truth in love. Now, we've got the correcting down. A lot of preachers, preachers have the correcting down. While we don't mind getting up and spitting and slobbering and tell people what they're doing wrong, but sometimes there's more hatefulness in it than there is anything. That's why people will turn you off. You get up, and listen, God's had to do a work in my life. When I was a young, you know how young preachers are? They get up and they preach on everything. I mean, they tell you everything you're doing wrong, but they're not doing it out of love. They're doing it just to be doing it. I've had to figure out through the years that you can correct people, but you better do it in love. Most any church member will take correcting if they know that you're doing it because you love them. But there's some, they just get up and they'll preach, and a lot of parents are the same way. It's like, it's like parenting. You can correct, and we need to correct our children. Children need correcting. The Bible says we don't need to spare the rod, and if you spare the rod, it's not if you spare the rod. People say, well, that verse says, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you spare the rod, you hate the child. It means if you love your children, you'll correct them. And that's, and that's why Jesus corrects us, because he loves us. But we have to do it in a heart of love. We have to do it because we love them. And that's why hey, every bit of preaching, we can tell the truth in preaching, but it needs to come from a heart of love. And listen, if we can parent, but it needs to come from a heart of love. I'm glad that Jesus has a correcting power. Calling power, calming power, correcting power. Number four, a challenging power. He has a challenging power. The Bible said, if you remember what happened to poor old Peter, Peter denied the Lord three times. 
I know not this man. I know not this man. And then the Bible says he cursed and said, I don't know this man. He denied him three times. The Bible says he looked up and he saw Jesus and their eyes met. That's how close they were. And the Bible says that when he saw the look on Jesus' face, that Peter went out and wept. And then what did he do? He said, I go a fishing. And he wasn't just going on a fishing trip. I honestly believe that Peter said, you know what, I'm not cut out for this. I'm done with this and Jesus thing. I'm done with this preaching. I'm done with I'm going back to what I know best, and that's fishing. He said, I go a fishing. And most of the other disciples will say, Well, we go too. They got in the boat and they rowed out. They fished all night. And how much did they catch? A big fat zero. The same thing I catch when I go fishing. Didn't catch a thing. Now these were professor, professional fishermen. They knew what they were doing, and they toiled all night and they didn't catch a thing. But then, thank God, that morning, they looked up and they saw a man standing on the shore. And he said, children, have you any meat? And they looked and they said, no, don't have a thing. He said, won't you cast the net on the other side? They throwed the net on the other side, and the Bible said they caught so many fish, they couldn't even hardly haul them in the ship. That's when they knew that this man was Jesus. The Bible said Peter was so excited that he jumped off, he jumped ship, and he swam the shore, and the others was trying to row to shore because he was wanting to get there to Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus, he restored Peter in that time. They went off a walking, and they was talking. And if you remember, he asked Jesus, you know, Jesus asked him three questions. Now you can figure however you want to figure. The Bible doesn't say, but he, he tells him three different times, Peter, lovest thou me? Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Peter, lovest thou me? Every time Peter would say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Yes, Lord, I know you. I, love you. I love you. And then he asked him that third time, Peter, lovest thou me? And the Bible says Peter got, ag- he got all aggravated. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. And every time Jesus looked at him, he said, feed my sheep feeding my sheep. In other words, I believe in his restoring of Peter, he was also challenging Peter. He said, Peter, if you really love me, you need to feed my sheep. In other words, you need need to do a work for me, Peter. You know that every single one of us have a work to do for Jesus Christ. Not just me. You know, we come to church and we think it's all up to the preacher. It's all up to the preacher. He's the one that's supposed to be getting out. He's the one that's supposed to be witnessing. He's the one that's supposed to be soul winning. Oh, absolutely not. Bible says if you read that the job of a pastor is to get up and equip the saints and then the saints are supposed to go out and do the soul winning. It's the saints that are supposed to be doing the work. It's the man of God that equips the saints with what God gives him. If you want to know exactly what the word of God says, But listen, we need to go out. There is a challenging power. Jesus has given us a challenge. Just as he told Peter, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou men? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said, Feed my sheep. There's a challenging power in the voice of Jesus. We need to be challenged more often than we think. This this challenging power comes through the Holy Spirit. It comes through that still, small voice that's within us. People say, well, you know, if Jesus would just tell me what to do, I'd be happy to do it. I don't know if we're looking for a big billboard that says it, or we're looking for heaven to roll back, and that voice will say, I want you to be a witness for me. It's not going to happen like that. That's not the way he works. He speaks to us through the word of God. He speaks to us through that still, small voice. When you're young people, when you're in school, and you have all those friends hanging around you, and they say, listen, won't you invite your friends to church? That's Jesus challenging your heart to to, to be a witness for him. When you're on your job, adults, and you're working, and, and God says, listen, you need to be a witness to them. Maybe it is it comes time to eat, and you know you need to be bowing your head and blessing your food, but you got all your co-workers around, and you're embarrassed. Jesus is saying, listen, you need to do it because that's a good witness for them. We need to live our lives in such a way that just as Jesus said, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to go out into the lost and dying world. And I know that that's the goats. You know, the goats are the ones that's not the sheep. But we need to get the goats in so God can save them and he'll turn them into sheep. And we need to be an encouragement to each other. And we need to help each other. That's why it's important that we come out to the house of God. You don't understand that when you're not here, how it affects the entire service. 
You don't understand that how you can be an encouragement to the preacher, an encouragement to the man of God, just by being here and just by supporting him. That is, that is feeding the man of God and feeding each other. That's why the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some. He said, but so much more. He said, exhorting one another and so much more as you see that day approaching. We need to lift each other up. We need to, ex we need to challenge each other. The Bible says, to provoke unto good works. That, that just, we, we push each other to good works. We help each other. We encourage each other. We're provoking each other unto good works. That's the challenging power. It hurts our pride to admit that we're coming up short sometimes, but we do. We come up short. We need to be challenged. Jesus challenges us because he wants more from us and he wants more for us. Then last of all, number five, there's a completing power. There's a completing power when it comes to Jesus. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, it says he's on the cross, he's dying, and then he said, I thirst, and they said they took a sponge and they put vinegar and they lifted it up to him. It says, and when Jesus had therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Three words, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When he said it is finished, he said it's complete, it's done, there's nothing else can be yet. You know what, we try to add so much to salvation. We say you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. fact of the matter is, we don't have to do anything. It's done, been done. It happened on the cross. He said it is finished. All we have to do is believe in what Jesus Christ has already done because the work is done. Well, that's why the Bible says he went down and he sat down on the right hand of the Father. He sat down because the work is done. It's done. There's a completing power in the voice of Jesus. We are complete in the Savior, nothing more to add to it, nothing more to be done. Jesus is all we need. I get thinking about Jesus. I mean, think about this. Simple things. I mean, most of these... The, the, I mean, oh ye of little faith, five words, all the rest of them were three words, Lazarus come forth, it is finished. I mean, all these things, peace be still, there's a calming power, there's a calling power, there's a completing power, there's a challenging power, there's a correcting power in the voice of Jesus Christ. I don't know what you're in need of here today, but I want you to know, as much as I don't know what you need, the Father in heaven knows what you need. And more than that, he can meet your need today. So whatever you need you have here today, Jesus can meet that need. If you're here today and you've never been saved by the wonderful, glorious grace of God, then he's calling you today. He's want, he said, I want you to come forward. He's wanting you to accept him and be saved today. Maybe you're here today and you have a storm going on in your life. Maybe it's a tumultuous time. You don't know which way to turn. There's a calming power to Jesus Christ. He can calm that storm in your life if you just come and ask him to do so. Maybe today you've not been living the way you need to live and there's a correctness. You've been feeling, you've been feeling Jesus speaking to your heart for some time now saying, listen, you need to do better. You need to get this out of your life. You need to take care of this. You know that this is not what you need to be doing. This, you know this is not the way you should be living. There's a correcting power. Maybe you're here today and you say, Boy, I used to be on fire for Jesus, but it just seems like the fire is just kind of, it's dwindled down in my life. Listen, he's challenging you today. He says, you can, you, can, you can have, listen, you can have as much of God as you want. It's up to you. He's challenging you today. How about today? Whatever your need is, he wants to meet that need. Let's stand on our feet with every head bowed and every eye closed. You have the message today. And if you feel like God's wanting to do something in your life, maybe he's challenging you, maybe he's calling you, maybe he's correcting you, whatever it is that Jesus has in your life, whatever it is Jesus is wanting to do in your life, won't you come this morning and let him do it today? Anybody feel the need of prayer today? The altar's open. How about it today? I'm not going to tarry long in the invitation. If, if the Holy Spirit of God can't draw you, I'm not going to drag you. But I'm wondering today, the altar's open. Do you feel the need to come today? That's right. If God's dealing with your heart for whatever reason, won't you come? Maybe, like I said, you're having a hard time. Won't you come and let the calming power and the calming voice of Jesus, he can do something with your life. How about it? Anyone else? Maybe you're here and say, Preacher, I'm not coming. 
But I do have some needs in my life. I do have some needs in my life. Would you just pray for me? Maybe you slip your hand up. I won't come. I won't call on you. I just want to pray with you. Maybe somebody today just slip your hand up. Preacher, would you remember me? I have some needs in my life. God bless that hand. You can take them right back. Now someone else. Preacher, God bless that hand. Someone else. Anybody else this morning? Preacher, would you remember me? We're going to pray. Anyone else? Father, we thank you today and we praise your holy name for who you are. God, we want to praise you for uh, that calming power. We want to praise you, Lord, for the calling power and the correcting power. We want to thank you for the completing power, Lord, the challenging power. All this, Lord God, little is much when you're in it. Lord, it's very short and it's very sweet, and we thank you for that today. We thank you for what you've done in the service today. We thank you for those on the altar. God, we pray for those today that you'd meet their needs. We pray for the hands that have been raised. God, we ask you that you'd touch them, help them, bless them. God, meet their needs as only you can. Lord, we love you today and we praise you for who you are. And God, we just ask you now, Lord, that you'd bless this church. We thank you, Lord God, for the blessings that you've already bestowed upon them. But God, we ask you in the days ahead, we ask you in the meeting coming up, God, that you'd give souls for your labor. Bless Brother Terry as he ministers here. Bless all those who are here today. God, we pray that you just bless them, help them live close to the cross. And Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for all you do. Continue to lead, guide, and direct us. And we'll give you praise for it all. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. Brother, you need to say anything else? Or? All right. Well, I want to thank everyone. I'll get this. We thank the Lord for you. Appreciate the confidence you have just to have us come. We hope it's been a blessing to you. And think about the message this morning. Just pray that God would take this word and you think upon it this week. And uh, most of all, just praise God for who he is in our lives. Isn't it wonderful that he can, whatever our need is, he can meet that need. And I thank God for it. All right, I want you to remember now service tonight, service 6, 7 o'clock. And I think said Brother Mac Arnold's going to be here tonight. So be back in service tonight. And uh, we appreciate you. We love you, church. Anything we can ever do for you, let us know. And like we said, God, a beautiful sanctuary. God, a beautiful church God's blessed you with. Now you just got to fill it up and do something for the Lord. All right, all hearts and minds clear this morning. Maybe somebody got a word on your heart, something you'd like to say before we dismiss service. Anybody? All right, praise God. Brother Johnny, won't you go ahead and pray uh, and dismiss us in a word of prayer?